a pleasure to be here and uh, have yeah, the opportunity yeah. to uh, well, share sure. important research with everyone. And I chose, well, I guess you and I both chose today, the, uh, the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. And I'm going to uh, share with you uh, some of my research that appear in, in some of my books on the Spanish flu of 1918. And I never, never thought that these oral histories would have such poignancy and importance, never thinking that we'd be going through something as horrible as this COVID. However, these stories are uh, firsthand interviews with people that I recorded years ago for my books that now, uh, you know, become extraordinarily important verbal documents of that time told by people that actually lived through them, who actually experienced it. And uh, I think the beauty of the interviews are that these were just the regular everyday people like our, ourselves, I guess, that just uh, mostly were all Italian Americans who uh, were faced with this horrible pandemic. And some of the parallels are such that you know, they're kind of chilling when you think of it. When the, when the pandemic struck, no one was ready for it. Um, people didn't know what to do about it. Um, and then it hit the Italian, it hit the Italian American uh, communities even harder because there was a language barrier. There was a cultural barrier. And so they're pretty much fending for themselves in these little villages and these little, or in these little uh, places like the Boston's North End and in some of the neighborhoods in New Haven. No. So what did they do? They fell back on their Southern Italian culture and their little village mentality and they tried their own home remedies. They made vows to the saints that if they were saved, uh, that they would, they would raise money for Our Lady of Pompeii. I have one story to share with you. So what I'm gonna to do today is uh, I'm just read you uh, some of the testimonies of these Italian Americans who, uh, who lived and survived obviously, through those horrible times that we're experiencing today. And the first story I want to read to you is from a woman, her name was, for those of you who understand Italian, well, this is in dialect, her name was Juanine De Maio, little Joanne. And uh, she was 97 at the time of the interview. And um, she tells a very interesting tale that I'm still trying to understand myself. And if there's any historians out there who know the answer to this question, I really would like to know myself because I can't quite understand it myself. But listen to the story. The name of the story is called, I Had to Put Her Shoes On. Now, New Haven was a, a booming town, at, uh, you know, industrial time, town in the 1918 period. It was going through an industrial rev revolution. They needed cheap labor and they had all the Italians, of course, working in these rubber factories and these uh, big, huge behemoth factories where they needed cheap labor. And this is her story. And Juanine and her friend worked in the candy rubber factory where they happened to hire Italians. You know, when that Spanish flu came out, I had a girlfriend. She was two days older than me. But I was a little skinny thing. But she was kind of chubby, but she wasn't fat. But she was strong and everything. But I could always lay her down, you know, wrestle her down. Even though I was skinny, I was stronger than she was. And everybody used to say, gee, Jen, you know, you're kind of skinny. But any day, anyway, one day we were going to work. So she says to me, you know, Jen, I don't feel too good. So I said, well, what made you come to work today? Because we had to take a very long walk to get to work. She says, I don't know. I says to her, so well, if you don't feel good, why don't you go home? But she went to work anyway. And she said to me, Jim, I just don't feel good. And in three days, she was dead. Her name was Anna Danteo. She was maybe 15 years old. Everybody on the street had that sickness, but this girl was the only one that died at the time. I could remember it like it was the other day. Her and I were just like sisters. So when I came home for work, the mother sent for me 
her mother called me. She says, Jenny, you know, we believe in our family that the best friend has to put the shoes of the dead girl back on. Can you imagine? They waited for me to come home from work to put shoes on her. So that when she was laid in the coffin, she would be wearing her shoes because I was her best friend. And when I picked her up, I can still picture it. It was like a stone in my hands and I put her shoes on. I so much remember that. That's fantastic. Uh, what year did you take the interview? This was, uh, I interviewed her in 1999. She was 97 at the time. So oh. she was 15 during the pandemic. Okay, so, she, so yeah, okay. Uh, that would be about the age uh, that uh, someone would remember it with some- uh, With some clarity. Clarity, yeah. Uh, very good. Uh, you can see that outside the uh, Casa Italia, and it's a little cold out here, but I'm using my car, my, I have a, a cup of tea here. So yeah. I'm, I'm staying warm, even though it's below zero. Uh, <laughs> you got another story that is fascinating. Oh, I have, I've got lots of stories to tell. Well, the next story I have is how the Italians in the old Southern Italian tradition would always ask for the saints. We, we, were, we believed more in the saints than we did the Pope. It was the old pagan tradition that we brought from the Greek world. And we always asked for the saints to intercede for, for us when we had troubles, we would pray to our favorite saint. And this was no exception when the pandemic came. This is a story from Luisa DeLauro, the mother of our Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. Oh, interesting. And this is her story of the pandemic in New Haven. My father died in 1918. I had the Spanish flu too with my father. Both of, both of us caught it, that flu. I was my father's pet. I was always in his arms. So the, the flu was contagious. So we both had that flu, but he died from it. But I survived in three days, in three days. There were no antibiotics in those days, nothing. I got through it though. And my mother made the vow that if I su survived, that she would dress me in red. She had so much faith in Our Lady of Pompeii and she was dressed in red. And she made this vow that she would go begging from door to door for Our Lady of Pompeii. And she did it. Imagine my mother, the big, big, big businesswoman begging from door to door. They used to give her 25 cents, 50 cents. And she used to take me with her. It was like begging from door to door. But a lot of people didn't make it. People were dying in the streets. People would drop dead right in the street. That was very good. Touching. This is the power I, you know, this is, and this is my joy of writing history, recording history, documenting our Italian American history in a different way through oral history. Um, where people speak, where our ancestors tell us the story as if they were putting us on our knees as their grandchildren, telling us their tales, their experiences. And this is what I've done for the last 40 years and I'm so grateful that I had, you know, the opportunity to run into, to, to meet people like Juanine and Luisa DeLauro. And the next story takes place in Boston's North End. Now, like I said, people were using their own home remedies because there were no antibiotics and they were left to their own wits. Many of the women, as you know, in our culture, especially in Southern Italian culture, they were the nurses and the doctors of the time because no one could afford doctors in those days. And so there was a lot of our, our medical culture in, in Southern Italy was based on home remedies. Kind of like, like witch doctors, I suppose, in a good sense. The name of this is called, and 
this woman, Mary Molinari, she recreates, I think, that sense of horror and panic and desperation in her neighborhood. The name of this story is called Garlic. My mother held our family together, my three sisters, my brother, and he made sure that nothing was gonna happen to us. And that's when we had the Spanish flu at that time. I was the youngest of all of us. And my dad was worried, so worried, that they used to put that stuff around your neck, that camphor. Oh, they were dying like flies in those days and they were crying. Now, for those of you who understand dialect, this is what she said. Oh, she was recreating what was around her. A morte fijima, a morte juan, a morte quilada. Oh, my son died. Oh, John died. Oh my God, the other one just died. Because she was getting the frequency of the, how many people were dying. So my mother put my mother put garlic all around and camphor. We used to carry that. And my father had a bottle of three-star brandy. And every morning he'd give us a teaspoon, a little glass of that. He used to put it in an eyedropper for me because I was small. And he used to give me a little bit. And I used to feel a little drunk as a child. And I asked after a while, I started looking for the brandy because I kind of liked it. But my father was the type, he was afraid his children were going to get sick but we didn't have doctors, we couldn't afford it. So that's what we did. But thank God, none of us got it. The garlic was to keep away the germs of the flu. Maybe they thought it was gonna help us. I don't know if it did or it didn't. The teachers told us camphor. And then we'd have a string of pearls there with garlic, a string of garlic pearls around our neck. And we'd go out and the whole place in the North End looked like a garden of garlic. It stunk in the North End because everybody was wearing garlic. Sometimes my mother, you know what she used to do? In our food, she would load us with garlic. I tell you, when I talked to anybody, they would run away because I stunk of garlic. Yeah, okay. Uh, good for the food, uh, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, other stories, uh, you know, other remedies. When, when the times were going to school, the teachers would tell them to cut up camphor and wear it around your neck. That was another. Uh, was that like Vicks? Yeah. You might call it like the forerunner of a Vicks camphor. It was like aloe. Okay. You know, it's a, and this is, uh, this is one woman who was telling me, who told me the story it was called, it's called, uh, my sister lost her baby. The teachers told us to use camphor. We used to use camphor and we used to bring them in the bags. My sister lost her nine month year old baby. She was breastfeeding the baby and she didn't know that she had the flu. She lived, but the baby died. Oh, that baby was so beautiful and they couldn't get any undertaker. So the woman across the street came over and dressed the baby right on the table. They had to bear, bury her right away because she was turning purple. Yeah, in the research that I've done in the newspaper in Chicago Heights, there were always comments or there were always long lists of the people who had died and then information about the uh, undertakers being overwhelmed and they, they just couldn't handle the situation. We've seen a little bit of that in our pandemic as well. Uh, and uh, orders coming out of the mayor's office saying that uh, uh, all uh, entertainment uh, could be st should be stopped and the churches should be right. closed and all that sort of thing. So there is uh, uh, that parallel, but uh, there the, the mayors took, uh, well, in Chicago Heights anyway, uh, yeah. at that town, uh, the mayor took initiative. They, um, I have a couple of stories too about how they would just put them in the basement until they could, the undertaker would come around and they were just all in the basement and that was it until the time came that they could be removed. Uh, imagine that the, you know, the Spanish flu killed more people than in all our wars, World War I, II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, 675,000 people um, in our country. Yeah, we're approaching that. Uh, yeah, I- Before it's over, we may reach that again. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, it seems that's where we're heading. 
Oh, oh, now, do you have any men? You have a lot of women. I know that a lot of your work has focused on. Oh yeah. On women. Well, you uh, know, it, it, I have a, an interesting story, oral history. Uh, in nineteen ninety-eight, a while back, I inter interviewed a uh, a pharmacist who was almost a hundred years old in nineteen ninety-nine. And I'd never heard of anything like this before. Uh, his name was Anthony Fiondella. And he ran and owned the Granite's Corner Pharmacy in New Haven. New Haven, okay. In New Haven. And he resorted to his own methods uh, from the, the, uh, the medicines that he would get from companies. The early prescriptions were filled with the raw elements in those days before the companies took over. Pharmacists were pharmacists. They... Yeah, uh, it's pretty amazing. This guy was uh, a pharmacist, but he was kind of an alchemist when the, when the, when the flu hit uh, and people were just, again, uh, beside themselves with what to do. He came up with his own uh, elixirs, so to speak, and uh, enjoyed some success. And I, I want to read you his story. Okay. Um, the name of his story is called His Prescriptions Kept People Alive. And he's talking about um, his predecessor. When the deadly flu was around, that was about 1918, it killed a lot of people. Now, Dr. Conte used to take 50 cents because the people didn't have any money. The doctors had it hardened those days. They'd visit you they come to your house, have coffee, and play cards with you. <laughs> Today, they don't want to bother with you hardly. Now, Dr. Boardman, he had a good record. Not as many of his patients died as other doctors, and I don't know why. His prescriptions kept people alive. Maybe he had better formulas. He lost fewer patients than any doctor I knew around. Now the doctors just order what the companies tell them about. But we were putting up prescriptions till two or three in the morning, one after another. We didn't get anything. What did we get? 75 cents for a prescription in those days? The doctor's formula, whatever he wrote the prescriptions for in those days, had eight or 10 ingredients, all mixed. It wouldn't be just aspirin or something. They're not even heard of today. Some of those ingredients, but some of those are still used today in the drugs. In those days, we made all the medicine from the crude drug. Then the Eli, Eli Lilly company came in, which was a big laboratory in those days. They came out with fluid extracts and powdered extracts. And that saved us the tough step of trying to use, of mixing it with a mortar to make a powder of it. It was a lot of work to get the drug started first. We don't have to do that anymore. But we would just take a little of their extract and we'd make the same thing. We'd make our own little extract. Lilly saved the day with their fluid and powdered extracts because they extracted the drug that we wanted all we had to do was take a their extract to make whatever we wanted. That was in 1915. Why? He said to me, was that a long time ago? <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Reminds me of the, the scene in uh, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, the, the pharmacist who makes up the wrong drug. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Altered it reality. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, a lot of interesting stuff. Now, you've done a lot of oral history. What, what uh, is your, uh, did you get a lot of oral history material that was unuseful and that you were discarded? Hardly ever, Dominic. Everything that I ever recorded. Uh, now, you did this much. yourself. You did all the interviews yourself? All the interviews, I, yes. Well, and then, of course, you know, because I spoke the, well, because I spoke the language and I, Italian and because I speak the dialect and understand the dialect pretty well, at least the, the dialect of my, my family, it helped me a lot. Uh, because I, you know, that was the key to getting questions and answers from people, especially in Boston, where uh, 40 years ago, when I did all those interviews, many people still didn't speak English. So uh, in the interviewing process, they felt very, well, they felt very comfortable with me. Uh, for a number of reasons. It wasn't just because I spoke the language, but because I was 
actually I was a social worker at the time. So. Oh, well, I, I, I think that's a, a good training for uh, the historian to, to be a social worker. And I, yes. I, uh, uh, well, a lot of uh, the uh, helping professions do use uh, personal testimony, uh, life stories, yes. uh, biographies to... Well, uh, mine was a rare, rare, rare opportunity because I, I wasn't from the north end of Boston. Uh, it was a very closed community. And well, uh, fortunately, I got the job of running a senior citizen center in the middle of the neighborhood um, in 1978, uh, when the neighborhood was still, still pretty much old world, where you still had people um, speaking, you know, speaking the old dialects. And uh, from running programs for people, running this drop-in center where everyone was welcome, I got to know everybody on a first name basis. Again, because I spoke the language, you know, it, would, it was easy for people to more or less open up to me and tell me their troubles and problems. And after a while, uh, the word got out on the street. You know, if you got trouble, go see Anthony, he'll help you. <laughs> so, you know, the, the whole Italian American grapevine, mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody would come to me and before you know it, they'd be telling me their life stories. Mm -hmm. um, what they did in Southern Italy at the turn of the century and all these great stories. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, someone's got to record this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I did. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the field of um, geriatric care or whatever, or uh, social work among the, uh, the elderly has changed over the years. It's institutionalized yes. and uh, uh, so forth. Uh, that's really a big change. But also Italian-American identity has changed. Yes, it has. Do we have a future? What's the question again, Dominic? Do, do, uh, does Italian American identity have a future? Well, I think we're always going to have an identity. I think it's a question of what we're going to accept as our identity and who tells us what our identity is. Unless you dig deep into your own, I think, family experience, you need a roadmap to find your identity. And usually it's in your family. It's not in Hollywood. It's mm -hmm. not in Hollywood. It's in your family. But with the passage of time, because our oral tradition has changed so much where you would pass down stories from grandmother to grandson, just the geographics alone has changed our ability to find out who we really are. Because in the old days, if you had a question about your identity, all you had to do was ask your grandmother or your great aunt, yeah. your mother. For yeah. a story. Or your mother would tell you the story whether you, <laughs> where you were sitting at the dinner table and they would constantly remind you of who you were, where you came from. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to learn more, you could have done that. Today, Grandma doesn't live downstairs anymore. That's, that's a real long thing of the past. You know, grandparents and children, grandchildren hardly. And that's what broke, I think, the oral tradition and cut off the bridge to our identities so that we fall into Hollywood. We fall into, you know, the Sopranos. We fall into the Godfather. Whether you agree with it, you disagree with it, if you don't know your identity, you got the screen, you got the movies, and what else do you have? So you find a lot of people, well, at least I do, kind of hitching their car to that train, to, you know, soprano train, uh -huh. you know, yeah. mobster train. Um, I just wrote in my last, my new book that's coming out that, you know, you can hit your, your car to that. You can, you can, you know, you can talk like a wise guy if you want to. And you can, you know, get that sense of bravado of being somehow connected to something that's sinister. Just remember something. Behind your back, when people are in their living rooms, they're not yucking it up anymore about, you know, how tough you are. They're distrusting you because they suspect you're in some sort of organized crime. And the majority of us are not. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
yeah, it is galling to us who uh, prize the poor uh, illiterate immigrants who came a uh, uh, hundred years ago now, uh, and even that is uh, uh, not as much as, as it could be, who came a hundred years ago. And that's our image of an Italian and hardworking people uh, who considered the uh, the gangsters as being afraid to work or uh, useless people because yeah. they're afraid of shirking work and yeah. uh, the noble the nobility of work etc. But I guess that uh, well, I mean, just like many other ethnic groups, what comes through in lots of my oral histories is that that hard work built this country. Yeah. Oh, well, there is something to that. We named it, we built it. We, what, I can't remember what the last one is, but uh, we own it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, anything else about the, the, the photography? What do you get out of photography? They, they're just pictures in a sense. Well, the photography book that I published a few years ago called From Italy to the North End, I think visually documents what an Italian American neighborhood looked like in a way I don't think that's ever been shown before in that I had access to people's lives so that I could pretty much be part of their lives and follow them and be very comfortable. And they were comfortable with me um, photographing them in their just old European lifestyle that they brought from the turn of the century that made it until the late seventies. And that's what I pretty much did. I documented daily life in this neighborhood um, because I felt that we really didn't have any, I mean, yes, there's, there are snippets here and there of different Italian American cities. I don't mean to say that there hasn't been excellent work done and there hasn't been a lot of documentarians that have gone around but mine was a little bit different in that it was every day, all the time when I would do a home visit or someone would come to, you know, I could do a street portrait and people would feel, they would give me something that, you know, a photojournalist from the outside looking in could never get. Mm -hmm. uh, my work is more from the inside looking out. So and I would say. When I see one of your pictures, what should I look at the faces? What's in the background? Uh, is there a clock or a calendar in there that, that gives you more clues to the picture? If you look at some of the faces that I captured from the North End, especially, you see history. You see hard work. You see something of that virtue. It just comes through in those, if I may say so. It just, they just come through in those, in those portraits. Um, and these people were our ancestors. They could have just as easily been in Chicago. They could have been in New Haven. They could have been, they pretty well, much, I think, speak for who we were. Well, a, a note uh, on pictures. Uh, I would have you to show. I don't have, I didn't. Well, uh, any, uh, I have been uh, big on pictures. Uh, and we have collected a lot. We've written a half dozen books uh, that were just basically picture books. Uh, but all around the country, Italian Americans have documented the history of Italians in their particular city. This is for the Arcadia series. Yes. And we have in our library some 65 books cities. that each have a couple hundred pictures of their particular city and the Italians in it. So uh, we have, thanks to Arcadia, I know their I mean, no, purpose was making money, but they have uh, uh, inadvertently or maybe vertently uh, uh, collected uh, thousands and thousands of images that would have been lost, lost yes. to the general public yes. uh, if, if not. I see that uh, you play the guitar. No, that's my wife. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask for a guitar solo. No, no that I won't do. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, let's. Uh, uh, I think we have a, a a little bit about your your own family background, your personal history. Uh, where in Italy uh, is your family from, and all that? Well, my family is from. If, when I go to Italy and I tell them the name of the towns, they scratch their heads because the towns are so small and uh, almost uh, you know they're so minuscule. The, they all came from the Campania region near Caserta. Mm -hmm. uh, they were mountain folks. Um, they were farmers, all four, all four of my grandparents. And the, the beauty of it was that uh, they all lived around me when I was growing up. They lived downstairs, one set, and then next door, the other set, and then across the street, aunts and uncles who didn't venture very far. So I kind of grew up in this transplanted Italian, uh, southern Italian village with grandparents all around. And uh, I always like to say that it, you know, if I wanted to go back to, to 1800, all I had to do was to walk downstairs mm. and uh, I'd be in 1800, 18th century Italy again with my grandmother and grandfather. And uh, it was my grandmother that really uh, inspired me because uh, she just uh, and I were just very close. And uh, I know I would say to her, because I wanted to, I wanted to know my identity through her. And I would say, Graham, of course, I'm in, I'm in grammar school now and I'm learning about, and I didn't understand the difference between Northern and Southern Italy. And I'm reading about Bernini and Michelangelo and Dante. And I'm thinking, wow, what a great culture. These people were really, and I'd say to my grandmother, you know, why would you want to leave Italy? I didn't realize my grandmother came from the South. It was a, you know, they were in dire straits. They were subsistence farmers. They, she lived up in the hills. They didn't have electricity. And she would say to me, because I know like, and that was it. And I said, well, that's it. Yeah, I don't know like, and I never understood that until I got older. And that was because she didn't want to talk about it because it was a miseria. That's what it was. And it was awful. And um, so that started off my journey back to Italy. That's what got me uh, started uh, trying to go back and find my roots. Like you said before, you know, your identity I guess I took it a little ser more seriously than a lot of people at, at the time in the, you know, in the mid seventies, early seventies, you but know. Did you learn Italian language at home? I learned, I had it in my ear and I, it was around me, but my parents spoke up in Italian, not down. My grandparents and my parents spoke it all the time, but they never spoke it to us. But when I would go down to my grandmother, we had our own language. So we, we invented our own little language because she, her English was not that good and my Italian was needed work. Mm -hmm. So at a very early age, when I started going back to Italy, I learned it very, very quickly. And so I, cause I, I kind of had it in me, uh, I just needed a little uh, prompting. So my travels back to, the first thing I did was I went back to uh, Italy and I found my, my relatives there and stayed with them a, a while. And uh, of course, when I got back to the North End, uh, well, it's a long story. I had gotten a fellowship to Syracuse University after I graduated from Providence College. I spent a year in Florence. Um, and of course, then I would go down south a lot. I'd go on my photography ex you know, excursions when I could. And I was totally immersed in the language. And, uh, and then when I came back to the North End and worked there for six years, I would come home and laugh with my wife and say, you know, I spoke more Italian today than I spoke English. And uh, for that went on for six years. So. Uh, well, very good. Well, uh, let's uh, open it up to questions and comments from uh, uh, our, uh, our fellow uh, participants. And uh, let's see if uh, there are anyone uh, in the think are from uh, Peter Barbello. Uh, Barbella has a question. Peter, do you want to ask your question? Unmute. That's bad day. Okay, you're there. All right. Which question? Well, you had a. Do you think that our grandparents were victims of the? Yes, that's a that's a that's a question that that's something that is on my mind all the time. As as I toured southern Italy, I, I just simply couldn't believe the beauty that I saw. And I had the same question that you had, uh, Anthony. Why would anyone want to leave this place? And, and so far, my research is zeroing in on the fact that 
the Risorgimento gave benefit mostly to the North, but left the South sucking wind. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why in the 1900s, it seems to me that half of the Southern Italy came to New York. Uh, do you think that's the reason that they, your grandparents wanted to move? Yes, that's exactly, that's the, the roots of it was in 1860 when they declared unification. Um, and what it spelled for the South was uh, colonization. They took over the industries. They dismantled the factories and brought them to the North. They increased uh, taxes uh, disproportionately to fund the Northern school system, the irrigation plans, the transportation systems. They actually, um, the, the, the army invaded towns like Pantalandolfo and murdered people, those people that fought back. And it was a civil war. And uh, Peter, is it Peter? See, si. Peter, I'm not, you know, I'm not one to sell books, try to sell my own books, but I'm going to tell you in my next book that's coming out, which is be out in hopefully soon, the first chapter is exactly what happened in Southern Italy. It's on the unification. And the new book is called Stories, Streets, and Saints, the North End of Boston. And in it, I go through the whole Risorgimento. And I was fortunate enough to have some help from this gentleman in, the, in, in Florence, Italy. His name was Loretto Giovanoni. He uncovered uh, all the, the hidden documents uh, from the Risorgimento, all the murders, all the people that were sent packing that were, they were um, expatriated for being uh, in the South. They, they put them on islands. Uh, as prisoners of war. It's an amazing story that many, many Italian Americans may have an understanding of, but it's much deeper than that. That's why they came. Exactly why they came. Most I, of them. I will look for that book. Yeah, in, in time, it'll be out, but it's, it, just, it just outlines what actually happened in 1860 when they called when they said Italy was unified, it was exactly the opposite. It was a total assault on the South. And the South is still reels from that to, th to this day. Do you, do you put the finger on Garibaldi? No, it's not so much Garibaldi. He was just, he was just a puppet in the whole scheme between the House of Savoy and the, you know, the King. He was all, it was a big, that was a show. But uh, um, it was definitely the House of Savoy it was definitely the Piedmont government. It was a, a willful, uh, murderous campaign to subjugate the South for the North. And you, it's, it's not that it, uh, it's all documented. It's not, uh, this is not uh, a fairy tale. It's not an exaggeration. It's just never been told before. Many, many Italian Americans in this country. And I'm so grateful to Loretto for opening my eyes and explaining, you know, giving me the benefit of his, his uh, research. He went into the archives and, and dug out all these uh, uh, documents that proved that these, you know, the, the Northern army marched down into the South and just leveled uh, villages, murdered people indiscriminately, passed the PICA laws that made it, you, you couldn't even have a trial if they suspected you of being what they call a brigante, which is what I go into in the book. Mm -hmm. um, but I could spend all afternoon talking to you about that. Well, I'm uh, gonna I'm gonna pass the the uh, the, the mic on to someone else. Touch with me, and you know you can. Um, my my uh, my uh, website is www.anthonyricchio.com. It's very simple. Um, okay. I'm very happy to stay in touch with all of you. Um, I feel like we're kind of we have to uh, share our resources. And I, I'm going to post in the messages a link to a 1860s book, which purports to be a biography of Vittorio Emanuel. Yeah, I think it has a lot of that information in it. Yes. And, and with that, 
And with that, Dominic, would you get me off the camera before I break my machine? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we do have a couple other people waiting in line. Uh, like perhaps Gabe could go next. Oh, right. Thank you. Anthony, this is great. Good seeing you again, even though it's virtual. Uh, yeah, can you guys hear me? Mallet. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. You. Fine. Okay, yeah. Unfortunately, I can't put my last name on. I don't know why I just came on as Gabe. All right. It's, it's really Gabriele. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm Italian. I'm not Jewish. Um, anyway, my, my, my comment is this. And Anthony, you knew my grandparents. And, and you knew, you know. You Why don't you tell them where you're from and the connection? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my family is 100% Abu uh, We're from, well, let's see. Not Solmona. That's the main town. But my father was born in Introdacqua. Or a, a section of Fazione of Introdacqua. And my mother was born in Valle Larga, which is a frazione of Petorano Surgizio. And the, the claim to fame of our part of Abruzzi is Confetti Mario Pellino, the great confetti place in Solmona. All right. And I actually met Mario. He's a great guy. He's also he's a fellow engineer like me. Uh, anyway, I grew up in the North End. I, I'm, I'm a- Boston. You don't know. You got to tell him Boston gave. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought there was only one North End. Yeah, they, there is only one North End. You know, there are two Mount Washingtons, but there's only one North End. Mount <laughs> Washington, as you people may know, there's the original one. And then there's a small mountain, a hill in Pittsburgh that they think they think is Mount Washington. Anyway, uh, uh, I don't know if my grandfather, uh, Francesco, uh, or Shaquille, as we call him, uh, explained to you why he came here in 1913. He would tell me, and my grandmother would tell me, she la miseria. As I speak in my Abruzzese language dialect, and thank God my parents and grandparents taught me a dialect before I learned real Italian when I went to school. Uh, anyhow, there was La Miseria, and, and it was not just my grandfather who came here, but his uncle was here before him, and so was his father, going back to the 1880s, I believe, as far as I can tell from what I found on uh, my heritage site. Um, and it was because there was no work. Yeah, there was some work. If you had a store, if you had a really good farm, you stayed there. But if you didn't really have anything, if you wanted to feed your family, you had to find a way to leave. Now, my grandfather left. He was only, what, 15 years old. He came to this country, didn't know where to go, uh, thought that people in America would try to rob him if, if he talked to them. I think, Anthony, you brought that up about the conference. Well, his new book, his whole yeah. story. Oh, it's in there. Beautiful. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah. He goes, yeah. Anyway, the poor guy made it all the way to Columbus, Ohio, to work with his uncle uh, and, and then actually with his cousin, uh, Gabriel. And then there's a funny story how the second time when he came back, and he actually had to bring the money back to, to his mother, he came back a second time to do some more work and he landed, you know, this time in New York City to try to make it, he goes, but how could I make money at 15 cents an hour, a picket shop? That was the old, you know, the old laborer job, a picket shop. I don't know if you guys ever heard that expression. Pick a shop, pick and shop, basically yeah. a laborer, okay? And, and I think I just put up here that uh, he told me, and I don't know how true it was, but apparently he actually saved John D. Rockefeller's life when a when a cement buggy came loose from Rockefeller Center and he pushed them out of the way. And the guy says, oh, thank you. This little skinny guy goes, oh, thank you very much. He gave him a dime. And, and the foreman goes and says, hey, do you know who that was? He says, no. He goes, that was the billionaire, John D. Rockefeller. He said some things in the time. I will repeat them. Right? That's all he gave me? But that was, that was the story of my grandfather who was something. He was something. Else. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Okay, like Gabe. Ka Kyla wants to talk. And Anthony, I will try to find the information you wanted when I can get it. No, no problem. All right. And yep. good luck on the book. Yes. Uh, Kyla. Hi. Oh, thank you, Dr. Reacher. That was, those uh, oral histories of the, the plague are, I mean, well, the plague. <laughs> I, wish you, I wish you a related congratulations. Oh, thank you. Um, your your uh, being the chair having the chair and being the professor of the chair at the casa oh well thank you i'm i'm still pinching myself can't believe thank thank you to dominic for having made yeah, the position well, possible i just watched the whole uh evolution of it uh mm -hmm. 
and just I just admire Dominic's e effort so much for having done that. And then you there, uh, congratulations, and I wish you well. Thank you. Well, I like I said, I can't thank Dominic enough for all his efforts with that. Um, yes. Yeah, I had a couple of quick comments. And first of all, some of what you were saying there, I, I've been teaching that history right now, the uh, post-Unitarian uh, history, uh, what happened there too. So it's very controversial right now in Italy. There's this oh, yeah. neo-Borbanism uh, movement that's going on there. So, um, and there was Pino Aprile's book that came out, yes. Terroni. Yes, that, Terroni. Um, yeah. And some of that evidence is being parceled out thing, but I do teach my students about uh, the the violent suppression of the brigands and yes. how, how that went on there too. So, but- Can uh, I just add something? Um, I have to just say this. You said the brigands. What I bring out in the new book, was the role of the briga the brigantese? Oh yes, a, yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. fascinating. What yeah, there were women that fought aside the men, oh absolutely too, like that. And okay. what the movement was about, you know, there wasn't. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's. There's a lot to unpackage with that history. I guess is what I wanted to there say. There really is. Um, the other comment I wanted to make was uh, how we fill in about our identity. I mean, that's one of the topics I write about. And yes, it's true. When uh, when you have missing pieces of yourself, you look for some other way to fill it in. And that right. can be the media or public things. But uh, I would like to think some of what we're doing in the program with uh, with literature uh, helps helps fulfill that. Yes. To, read to read about people who had similar experiences to your own ancestors and that that comes yes. to life through the, the literature. And along with that, I wanted to know you being from New Haven, if you've read uh, Armin Perata, uh, Perata's uh, Take a Number. No, I haven't. Oh, I will <laughs> send you the link to that. He grew up in New Haven. He became a big restaurateur um, and he wrote his own, uh, it's it's fiction, but it's really funny. And it's okay. based on his own life story of growing up in Hartford's yeah, Little do. Italy. You have my contact. It's just yeah, I will. I will send you that. He's called. It's um. It, it's out of print now, but I still have my students read sections of. It. It's called Take a Number. Okay. It's Armando Perretta, and um, it was written yeah. in the 1950s. And like I oh. said, he had a. Uh, a restaurant that he was well known for running and it was in and was up and running until the 1980s. So I still teach little segments about that in my class. Yes, I'm very interested. Thank you for the, yes. uh, the lead. So, like I said, you have my you have my contact information. I think I can get it through Dominic if I don't. So yeah. uh, but uh, he and he, in fact, there is a public school curriculum in New Haven in Connecticut that talks about ethnic Connecticut. And his novel is excerpted in the sample curriculum as part of uh, the Italian American experience uh, of that ethnic group within um, oh, Connecticut. So oh, so just to get how, how important literature is and preserving it and making sure it's read and brought forward. So. Well, then people like yourself are helping, helping answer yeah. the question that Dominic answered me, mm -hmm. asked me is that, you know, how do you get there? Yeah. How do you yeah. get to your identity? Mm -hmm. you, you rediscover the missing pieces and you fill in what's not there, you know, from other so sources. Literature. Yeah, literature mm -hmm. is one of them. And last, just on a personal note, um, I'm from Providence, Rhode Island. Right. My father is a Providence College grad wow. in my first home that I lived in for quite a while with my husband was on Hilltop Avenue, which was between Smith Street and Eaton Street, right on top of Providence College. <laughs> oh, I that. That's terrific. That's terrific. Yeah. And your, your dad graduated when? Uh, 63 uh, from Providence I've, College. I've missed him by a few years. But yeah, yeah. So. Well, that was, that was Providence College was, uh, played a major role in my life. You know, they had this, uh, they had this program, they had a study program uh, in the summer in Pietra Santa, oh. um, outside of Florence, outside mm -hmm. of Pisa, actually. And uh, they would run that every summer. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to go on it uh, at a time in, in my college career where I really didn't know, again, looking for my identity. And uh, so Providence was a very special place for me. My father liked Providence College a lot too. He grew up, he spoke, um, you know, he learned speaking because he spent a lot of time with his grandparents. And then he studied Italian formally oh. at Providence College so really for a couple of years so yeah anyway. mine's all book learned I had to go to school to learn That's it because okay. it wasn't a living language when I was growing up in my home but but thank you very much I'm very thank interested you. in your your work and I was this was a really fascinating presentation thank so thank you yes let me stay in touch from Italy Rosaria Maria oh Rosario. hello Dominic hello Anthony Hi. I really appreciated your talk about you know, history, oral history. Uh, what especially fascinated me is the connection between history and the 
figure of the nonni grandparents. Now, I myself grew up with my grandmother that I never called nonna. I called her Mama Lena. And Mama it was Lena. natural to me. Everybody thought That's I had correct. two mothers. And um, actually, when I was learning the so-called Italian language, I was really learning the dialect from her. From and where? I realized, where yeah, where she was from Ricigliano. Um, you know, there is uh, a place where the Ricciglianese. Where's that? Yeah, Which province is that? Uh, that's on the border of Campania and Lucania, Basilicata. It's okay. the last town in the province of Salerno. Okay, uh, wow. You know, yeah, really nice. So, you know, when I was learning Italian, I was really learning the dialect, dialect. and, um, you know, so many words and so many expressions actually have even disappeared in Ricciano. Yes. Nobody speaks Nobody like speaks it. my grandmother, you know that. And even her own children, my mom, my aunts and uncles don't speak the language that I remember. I remember. know more of it than yeah. my own, my parents. Yeah and my uncles and relatives do. So my question is, um, in your stories and in your research and in your works, uh, what is the place that you set for dialect related to the oral history? Is it important for you? Well, a lot of my oral history interviews are in pure dialect. In other words, the people spoke to me in the dialect that was spoken, like you, like you were saying, like your grandmother, the dialect that was brought here in 1890 with words and expressions and, and mannerisms, you know, ways of speaking that just don't exist here. And I have to tell you, when I went to transcribe these stories from Italian or from the dialect to English, I had problems because there were a few words here and there that people didn't even know in Italy anymore because they had forgotten <laughs> some of these words. And I had I gotta tell you for this next book, um, there are several examples of stories that I had to translate where I had to, luckily I have some very, very, very kind friends in Italy that have helped me out that have, you know, they have been relentless in asking the oldest people that they know to find out the meanings of some of these words. And the good news is in this new book that uh, I have translated them or transcribed them and translated them perfectly enough so that we get the real essence of, you know, what they were saying in these. But here's the other beautiful thing about this, the research is that I have these tapes that are now digital of these people speaking in these dialects that no one speaks anymore. Sicilian, I would say, he's uh, Gabe's grandfather. He's a, his grandfather, I interviewed a few times in 1980, he spoke in Abruzzese. I have a couple, I have a woman from the town of Riposto in Sicily. She spoke a dialect that's, it's, it's uh, very, very, it's beautiful. But again, I have all these examples of, of these, uh, these dialects. Uh, that are the backbone of a lot of the interviews that were spoken in America, in the North End of Boston, that I, you'd hear every day. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have had the chance at the time in the late 70s, early 80s, to be able to have met these people, be close to them, and to record them because they're gone. Mm -hmm. Like you said, like you said, you know, no one speaks them anymore. And they don't even speak them. It's tough to find out. Even in Italy, they don't speak them. So we have some very rare uh, examples, you know, examples of language that are that are lost now in these tapes, in these uh, these digital files that I have, and hopefully some archives or some library someday will, I don't know where, but will have the benefit of these so that well, that will be lost. A library could be the default. We'll uh, see. The last resort or whatever it is. Anybody else want to? Thank you. Question, uh, wave your hand. Uh, we'll call on you, Ed. Okay, uh, unmute, Ed. Uh, 
How's that? Okay. Hi, Anthony. Wow. Is this, is this, 61. this is how we have to meet on a computer? Yeah, this is the first time we've actually met. How many times um, I've come to Bristol and you weren't home? You're not home. I know it. <laughs> uh, Providence College 61, friendly with Carla's dad for many, many years. Oh. Uh, and so I grew up in a multi-ethnic neighborhood in Providence, uh, trying to deny, if you will, my Italian heritage, because uh, my grandparents uh, looked funny, talked funny, dressed funny. So um, I want to just mention, so when I first went to Italy and heard the language in Florence, I said, oh, I have to learn this language. And that's when I started to get back to my culture. But there's a phenomenon that I want you to address. Um, I have a cousin in Lawrence, Massachusetts. I've been back to his town, Raccomonfina, which is just a little north of Naples, as you know. And I said to him, have you been back? He said, I've been here since, 19 the, this is the 50s wave now. And yeah. I've never <laughs> been back. And I don't want to go back because I was a slave in the hills. And then the Germans came and we had to hide from the Germans for a long period of time. So I have no good memories. And I said, your town is beautiful. He said, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. So he never went it's back, not 50 a bit plus years. So, so how do you explain that phenomenon of that bad memory carried, carried forward and never forgot? Well, don't forget, you know, when, when our ancestors got here, uh, this country gave them opportunities that they could never ever have in the old country. So when they compared the two, I think, when they saw the goodness of this country, the greatness of this a great country of ours right now, then they compared it to where they left and said, you know, why should I even go back there? Why would I, why, why would I want to, you know, relive that, that difficult part of my life? I'm going to just forget it. And that happened a lot, a lot of, yeah. a lot of your, your, your cousin and my grandmother were this, it was the same thing. Um, don't talk about it. Uh, don't mention it. Uh, no. Mention it, but uh, let's not dwell on it. We're in America now. We're going to make it here. This country's given us chances that our old country, there's a great story in one book. I just got to share this with you. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's in, I wrote this book on Italian women a few years ago called Farms, Factories, and Families, Italian-American Women of Connecticut. It's, uh, I ran all over the state of Connecticut interviewing Italian-American women. And one of them, uh, I'll never forget how she said this, and it, it, when I'd go and give book talks, I would get choked up. And it, the woman's name was Maria Grazia Sant'Aqua. Beautiful name. And she, the story goes, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, she was going to get her citizenship papers in the early 50s. And she was an immigrant. She had come over in the 20s or the teens. And the judge, it's a very dramatic and beautiful story how she goes before the judge and the judge says, why do you want to become a citizen? And she says, I love my, she said, I left Italy. I loved my old country, but I love this country because they send people to school here. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. Opportunity. Something that she could never have there. Opportunity. Opportunities yeah. in Southern Italy, they, she could, if you went to the fourth grade, as a woman, especially in Southern Italy at that time, you were considered pretty fortunate. If you got to the sixth grade, you were something. If, God forbid, you made it to the, you know, grammar school, you were Professor Edison, you know, you were yeah. really smart. But yeah. that's, because this was the land of opportunity. And think about it, you know, you want to pursue the future. You don't want to look into the past. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Peter Thank Perrow. you, Ed. Nice to talk to you. My pleasure. Yes, sir. Peter Perrow, unmute. Un there, Tony. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, Welcome. You, you mentioned your book, Farms factories and uh, in all your talk today, I, I didn't hear any names of places that commonly employed the Italians. I'm interested in that wherever I go. Uh, we've got Pullman, we've got Hart Schaffner and Marx, we've got yeah. places like yeah. that here in Chicago. What, big, uh, 
beyond the beyond the uh, New Haven Railroad, what else is there that people in New Haven? Thank in you. New Haven? It, you asked me specifically for the what was the biggest? Yeah, thing? yeah some names that uh, there was a play, there was a factory, Peter. I, I don't know if you've ever been to New Haven, because there's a, there's a canyon right now, an empty canyon of what what was the Sergeant Factory. It was the Sergeant. forerunner. Believe, think of it in this this way. It was the forerunner of Home Depot. It oh. took up city blocks. It was down on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. It had a, a a pier that went out to the into the harbor, and they manufactured caskets and and uh, um, hardware, and um, they exported it all over the world. And I think they employed between five and six thousand people that. You know, they were working in these horrible conditions, putting their hands in muriatic acid while they cleaned and the men would come home covered with red, you know, from in, inhaling all the, you know, all the uh, fumes and all the, uh, the, the shrapnel from the, from, from the buffers and the polishers. It was a humongous factory. And there's a saying that they, the, the wife of Sargent uh, was Italian, she was from Luca she would go over to Italy and they would recruit Southern Italians to come and work in the factory. So much so that there was a saying in New Haven, they used to say, Ubota se ferma sergeants. Meaning that the first place you stopped when you got to New Haven was at the sergeant's factory. You went to the employment office, you got your job. Then you walked up to Worcester Street, uh, which was the, the Italian neighborhood at the time. And they found you an apartment and that's how you started your life here. There was also an L candy rubber rubber factory that employed hundreds if not thousands of Italians that made Arctics and exported them all over the world. Um, it, was a, it was amazing, it was a, a, a power, New Haven was a, a powerhouse. It was, a, it was an exploding you know, industrial revolution and they needed poor, it was prior to that, it was a carriage factory. Uh, they did all the Civil War carriages in the 1870s and 80s and they converted these, these spaces into huge factories. But those were the two big ones. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah. And a lot of them must have worked as gardeners for the- Some of them did, yes. Or... Some of them worked as gardeners, that's right. Some of them worked at, well, I don't want to paint a picture that they were all the, they weren't all, I mean, some of them, you know, they, they were mostly, the trades they held were masons, carpenters, barbers, and tailors. That made up the bulk of the rest of the Italians here. And you had a few artisans sprinkled in that, I mean, you had one guy who did all the gold leafing at the uh, at Yale's uh, uh, Sterling Library. He did all the gold leafing there uh, at Sterling. So. Yeah, and then we should get another effect. May oh, I ask a question? Okay. From Italy, Giuseppe De Bartolo. <laughs> Hello, Giuseppe. Hello. Oh, thank you very much, Anthony. Your presentation was very, very interesting. I ask a question no, in, in, Ita in italiano, in italiano la faccia. Allora, eh, il tuo lavoro di trascrizione delle storie dal dialetto, diciamo, napoletano, comunque dialetto meridionale, in inglese, è stato un lavoro molto, diciamo, gravoso perché il dialetto... Del, del, di quell'epoca 1918 era sì. eh, molto diverso, molto diverso dal dialetto di oggi, di oggi. Veramente... anche l'evoluzione del dialetto è stato eh, molto rapido infatti il dialetto di oggi che noi ancora parliamo in famiglia per esempio mm -hmm. è, è lontano rispetto al dialetto dei miei genitori e dal letto esatto. dei miei nonni. Quindi il lavoro che hai fatto was a, 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 big, a, a big job. <laughs> congratulations, congratulations. Grazie. Ma professore lo sa, questo tipo di lavoro per me almeno non è una questione di lavoro, perché mi piace, adoro questo lavoro, you know, è, è una cosa di cuore perché sono dei miei radici. E qual era il paese della Campania? E vuoi sapere? Sì. A mamma... Ve... Oh, mo parlo in dialetto. That's okay, that's okay, that's okay. A mamma mia è venuta da... 
nu paese vicina se s'arunca. Se s'arunca. Aurunca. Lo sai dove? Sì, sì, sì. Se s'arunca. Aurunca. Ma non proprio nella città. In da una frazione. Negli arunci, negli arunci in montagna. In montagna, ok. Un piccolissimo okay. paese che si chiama Cescheto. Cescheto. Cescheto, Cescheto. Non era Cescheto, ma come diceva mamma mia, diceva Cescheto. Cescheto, Cescheto. sì, sì. E la, la storia che ha raccontato Giovannina, si chiamava Giovannina Di Maio? Di Maio, sì, Di Maio. Di Maio. Sì. Sì. Lo sai che a noi abbiamo un ministro, il ministro degli esteri, che si chiama Di Maio, ed è campano del, di Napoli. Di Napoli, della, de, de, de Napoli sì, sì. È interessantissimo quello che, che mi dice, che la differenza tra la, il dialetto di una volta e il dialetto di oggi, perché hanno perso certe parole, certe espressioni, secondo me. Non, sì, è, non, è, usano, è le la, stesse, non usano le stesse parole. E la traduzione rendere poi in, il senso mm -hmm. di, di quello che dicevano in inglese è, una, un, insomma, è, è molto è molto difficile fare questa trascrizione, quindi, quindi congratulazione ancora. Ma la bellezza di questi nastri, di queste cose registrate, che si può tornare indietro e risentire due, tre volte, quattro volte, cinque volte, sei volte, e così ho, ho fatto. No, e poi quando avevo difficoltà, meno male che avevo questi grandissimi amici in Italia, e li, li mandavo a loro, e loro con la stessa cosa, dieci, ventine di volte, eh. sentendo la stessa slaccio, sì, no. lo stesso, stesso estratto, sì, sì. per prendere solo una parola, certe volte un mese, un mese tra io e lui in Italia, risendendo e metten, mettendo insieme come un, come un caso laio, no? Sì, sì. La sì. significata di una frase... Ci voleva ogni tanto un mese, un mese. I was going to translate all of that, but... I'm sorry. Uh, it's boiling it down to uh, transcribing the dialect is really tough. Eh, really tough. And uh, eh, the dialect changes sai, any other language. Right. So, eh, lo sai che l'influenza eh, spagnola è un po' è stata rimossa dalla memoria collettiva. Non se n'è parlato fino a qualche anno, fino ad oggi che c'è il Covid-19. No, mm -hmm. Prima dell'influenza spagnola a cui fai riferimento all'epoca, no? in Italia per esempio non se ne parlava quasi mai. Io sentivo l'influenza spagnola, i miei, le mie zie sì, che, sì. che, che avevano, er, avevano superato l'influenza sì. spagnola ma ehm, se uno chiede ai giovani di oggi che cos'era l'influenza spagnola e quali problemi ha, quante, quante vittime, come è stata, come, come si è diciamo, diffusa, ehm, non lo sanno. Non lo sanno, non lo sanno. Io recentemente ho letto, se ti interessa, questo libro, questo libro di, di, questo libro di Laura Spine. Spine che è una giornalista inglese che fa la storia dell'influenza spagnola in, in, in tutto il mondo. È molto interessante. Ma Laura Spine. Po, professore, po, mi, mi può mandare eh, eh, il titolo sì, attraverso il mio email? Ok. Eh, io ti lascio il mio website, no, www.anthonyricciol.com dot com ok yeah. così okay. mettiamo in, in contatti no ok Tanto che... question anybody wave or scream or something uh, un <laughs> unmute uh, I think yes M uh, Mary Maturi Gibson hi Mary unmute please unmute there we go okay Anthony, I was so impressed with all of your information you. about medicine. You know, my mother was born in 1908 and she lived through that pandemic. My father was much older. He was 15 years older than her and he was in the army at that time. 
but my mother was uh, only uh, one of two children that survived in her family. And she went to sixth grade. Now she was considered a very educated woman. She was like a doctor. She would make yes. all of these potions. And I'm telling you, she made us drink and she never wasted a thing. The, yep. the Finocchio, she took everything from that. We yep. had, the, she gave us that stuff all the time. Yep. That oil of camphor. Oh my God, yep. she had <laughs> tons of that on us. And, and it, it, she used to cure all the animals. She yes. treated it, yes. just unbelievable. Great when tradition. I, I was like seven or eight years old. One of my older brothers, I was the youngest of six, obviously, because my parents were born a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And she, he got polio, one of my brothers. He was, I, he was probably about 13 or 14. And I remember the doctor coming to the house and saying, well, you know, it's too bad. We can't do anything. If he lives through the night, he'll live. And he really? left. My mother stayed up with him all night. She wrapped him in hot towels. She gave him little bits of aspirin. With, she squeezed oranges. She never wasted the peels or anything from the oranges <laughs> and the lemons. She would boil them and make us drink that water from there. And really? then take them and spread them outside for the animals, the peels left over. Imagine and that. My brother the next day was able to move his arms and legs and he lived. It really? was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. It was this just- This is Chicago, Mary? Pardon? Is this from Chicago? Are you in Chicago? Yes, yes. No. I, I'm rural I'm Indiana. A farm in Indiana. My parents came to to America in 1929. From where? From uh, uh, Sinagra Sigilia. Okay. Beautiful little tiny little town. Well, now it's a big town, but it yeah. was small then when they came here. And they came here because there was nothing to do there. There was nowhere. If you had a little piece of land, you could eat, but that was it. That you was didn't it. Have anything. Yep. They came here because we had, you know, they wanted us to be Americans. They wanted us to be educated and, yes. and live and have a better life. That's right. Okay. Like the lady yeah. said, they send you to school here. Right, right. Okay. Uh, sum up in 25 words or less, Anthony. Uh, your uh, take on Italian Americans it depends what. <laughs> well, my take on Italian Americans. I think we're in danger uh, of losing our identity. Okay. If we don't remember where we came from, and I'm I'm glad we talked about some of the ways to, and I'm I'm glad that. Uh, Professor Simonetta uh, reminded us all that there's still literature too. Well, thanks, Anthony Micho, for a fascinating.